Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's really excited to see you all in the chat and see that everyone's represented from all sorts of great places. Before we start though, I wanna ask sort of one question um, of all of us while we're here, not just the panelists, but, but of you in the audience as you're thinking about the questions you wanna ask too. You know, how do we connect YA fiction to one of the most pressing issues of our time? The juvenile injustice system is, we need to talk about this and we need to talk about this in serious ways. So one of the things we're using literature for, I mean, think about it, we all read, but we use literature as a mirror to ourselves. We wanna see where we are and who we are and where we wanna go. So, you know, using fiction to talk about real world issues is a really consequential act for all of us. So I just, I, I'm just gonna ask you all to keep that in mind when we're talking about this. These are exciting books. We've got exciting talents with us. I'm very excited that we're all in the same space, but you know, we do need to talk about really big, important ideas here. And, and art gives us a way to do that and a way for us to meet in the middle as it were. So I, I'm just very excited. Um, just to give you guys in the audience an idea, we're going to do a little bit of talking first, and then we're going to have some readings wow. from Punching the Air and Dear Justice, which some of you already know are gorgeous, gorgeous books. Some of you are going to discover how gorgeous these books are. Um, but I do want to start with something, a statement. Nell has co-authored an op-ed in the Washington Post. It ran earlier in June. She co-wrote it with Vincent Schiraldi, who's the co-director of the Columbia Justice Lab. And essentially, they say, youth prisons were never essential to public safety. They were just about placating fears. And I feel like this is a really important place for us to start. Um, we have had so many different kinds of conversations about justice and what that means and who gets justice in our communities around the country, um, really escalating since the spring. Um, but I do want to start there and sort of work our way backwards. So I'm not sure who, E.B., Nick, Youssef, Nell, who would like to start sort of addressing that. Maybe, Nell, you'd like to take that since that's your op-ed. But um, Sure. Uh, that statement, um, you know, it's not just a statement of opinion. I did mm -hmm. a lot of research for the book um, and a a couple of things stood out to me that just really confirmed that these places were not about safety. Uh, one was the fact that, you know, when you talk about risk factors for juvenile incarceration uh, or risk factors for adult incarceration, you hear about, you know, family breakdown and gang involvement and drugs and et cetera, et cetera. It turns out the greatest predictor of adult incarceration is juvenile incarceration. And that's when you control for crime. So it's not about what the kid did, but even a night or two in a juvenile facility uh, is a huge risk factor for kids. But I think the thing that really convinced me that we were telling ourselves a false narrative about the purpose of juvenile prisons um, was being a parent of two white teenagers while I was working on this book, um, who, you know, we had our moments, right? <laughs> like like every parent. And it turns out that some somewhere upwards of 90% of all teenagers in confidential interviews will tell you that they've not only broken the law at some point, but broken a law serious enough to get them incarcerated. But kids like mine don't get incarcerated because there aren't police in my neighborhood. You know, there's nobody searching their pockets. And if they do happen to get picked up, they're given chance after chance after chance. And that that somehow brought home uh, the racial function of these institutions in a way that no number of statistics could do it for me. Uh, and really convinced me that these places were a repository for our fears, a repository for, you know, our, our boogeymen and also a repository for the things that we didn't want to see, like children who were suffering, children who'd experienced trauma, children that we didn't know what else to do with. Um, you know, the other thing is, uh, be before this started, Nick and I were talking about our experiences going into these places and talking to kids. And as we were talking, I was thinking of the number of times people had asked me, you know, wasn't it scary to go into these places? You know, did, didn't you feel endangered? 
and if you've been inside and had the experience of kids who are just desperate to talk to you, that that question, like, yeah, they're scary because they're built to be scary. They're architecturally scary. They've got razor wire around them. Uh, but the the human warmth inside is so different than the the portrait that's painted. So that's that's where that sentence came from. I'm just uh, I'm just taking some notes <laughs> <laughs> because as a as a person who was formerly kidnapped by the by the system, mm -hmm. I think that um, it begins to really really show um, some truths. You know, I went back to Sing Sing to speak. I actually did a te TEDx at Sing Sing and I was overwhelmingly afraid. I was afraid because when I heard that door close, that's something that you can't unhear once you've heard it for years, especially if you're there unjustly. But to go back into the prison industrial complex to really help and, and, and maybe add light um, I just needed them to remember that I was free. And I was here as a guest. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them to make a mistake and think that I was I was supposed to be staying, you know. And I think that of course there's a lot of fiction in terms of films that have been made and created that kind of speak to that narrative. Um Antebellum is one that I think really, really blows the lid off of um the idea of what was is actually still what is, you know? Um, but I think that the best thing about fiction, fiction gives us the opportunity to, in, in a really uh, profound way, plant seeds of what could be because of what is. And the total unjust nature of the beginnings, you know, they talk about history as history being the uh, I think Angela Davis said, she said, we as a people have historical amnesia. And she was talking about black folks, of course. But I think historically, just in general, when when the thread isn't connected to the from the past to the present, there's a there's a loss because the past to the present is telling you a story about what is going on right now. It's telling you a story about poverty in a way that you would never really understand unless you understood what redlining was as an example you know and i think that that uh it it, it really is a powerful thing i think um, where we start now today in this discussion so i just wanted to kind of add that piece as, a, as as my thoughts just right off the top nick ab can we talk about can we talk about kwan and can we talk about amal can we talk about these kids because they really they're so wonderful, and I'm not. I'm not sure which of you would like to start. Yeah, I mean, so the interesting thing here about this, about kind of where we're at in the discussion, is this idea of fear, and um, kind of piggybacking off of uh, off of what Yusuf was just saying. It's always been so fascinating to me that the body that at one point was chained and forced to work for free is now a body that is feared. And like, I have done countless hours of research trying to figure out when that switchover happened, right? And I think about, um, I think about 13th, I think about um, policing systems and how they started as slave catching systems. And I just think about how fear is now a thing that's used to abuse the black body the same way that the whip was used to abuse the black body um, during the years of slavery in this country. And it's such a fascinating thing to me that people fear children. Um, I think about the 90s, I think about the super predator myth, I think about all of this propaganda, basically, that has created this fear inside of people of actual children. Like these are like children. And anybody here watching who has not heard of the super predator myth, who doesn't know what that is, do yourself a favor and look it up. Um, there's a documentary on it from years and years ago, but it is still so valid because in so many places, legislation that was put in place because of this faulty research is still very much in place. Like juvenile justice reform 
has begun and is underway in many states. Georgia, like I'm in Georgia, and Georgia is actually one of the states where they've they've made some significant strides in overturning some of the legislation um, that was enacted because of the super predator research. Um, but I think we all need to do a bit of a deep dive and figure out why we are afraid of children. Um, Evie, you're on mute. To add um, to what Nick, both Nick and Yousef said, both about fear and this idea of ch the ch children. Now, I, uh, you said something about how arbitrary juvenile uh, juvenile punishment, juvenile justice seems to be by making up this idea that children should be imprisoned. I was listening to something a few months ago about this idea of teenhood and how that was created as well by our society. Um, we, Nick and I both write for young adults and for many years, a young adult wasn't even a thing. You're a child yeah. and then you're an adult. Um, and maybe the only marker of that transition was going from knickers to long pants for boys, you know? Um, and, you know, I don't think our, our, our nation had rites of passages um, to mark that ch transition from childhood to adulthood um, in the industrial age at the turn of the last century. Um, so it seems that we make laws to just control whatever, you know, based on our ideas and they seem arbitrary, but they have real life consequences. Uh, to say this is this is not, you know, you're no longer a child, but you're not an adult. You're a teenager, but that that sort of that sort of definition does not apply to everyone. Um, it seems that, and I, I'm thinking of the history of young adult literature. Um, probably the one that is noted, often noted the most, is The Outsiders, and how that was written mm -hmm. by teenagers, and it was. Um, here are teenagers doing adult things. They don't know. They're not children. They're not adults and they don't have responsibility. They have all this free time. Woo, all the trouble they're going to get into. Um, so in that sense, it's like they're about white kids. And I believe, was it in Oklahoma or something? It wasn't even the inner was, city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't it was even Oklahoma. inner city. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to talk about criminality in black children how that's seen in one way, but criminality for white children in the middle of the country was seen as, oh, it's fun, it's exciting, it's mysterious mm -hmm. in the way that we talk about the outsiders. Um, but just teenhood in general being this um, idea of criminality for um, mm -hmm. black children, that is not the source of fear of, of black people. Um, I'm remembering the 13th um, documentary where Ava starts with, um, Birth of a Nation, um, mm -hmm. the first film, the foundation of Hollywood in America, um, that story was about the fear of the super predator, not 1990 super predator, but you know, 1900 super predator, the, the black man raping a white woman and how that comes to pass with Yousef's story in the Central Park Five Jogger case. And that goes all the way back from black bodies in, on the continent of Africa. Um, so I don't know, it just seems like we fear this thing, let's call it a thing, let's make rules around this thing, but let's not apply it to everybody. And those mm -hmm. who don't fit into that rule can get severely punished, can get years taken off their lives and can, um, can, you can lose their lives if you don't fit into that definition. And I think it's about time that we change the definition and change the ideas, just like um, change, the, change the definition, change the ideas and change the policies as like you said, Nick. And language really matters here. And we're not having the conversations around language. The fact that we talk about black children with, using adult terms. Mm. We don't, uh, black children are not allowed to be children in our society, that suddenly you're a man at 12. I'm sorry, no, I have never met a 12 year old that's remotely close to being an adult. So we need to start talking about these, the, the, the unequal consequences where, you know, as Evie was just saying in The Outsiders, you know, it's all high spirited fun. Everyone's trying to get along because the parents are nowhere to be found. And, you know, the older brothers have to raise the younger brothers. There's no morality that's ascribed to those 
child uh, to those teenage experiences. And yet now, and we've been doing this for quite some time, obviously, we've been ascribing a false morality. I, we're not talking about the poverty. We're not talking about kids like Amal and Kwan, and I'm going back to the books here for a second, Amal and Punching the Air and Kwan in Dear Justice, where their family structure is not stable. Kwan has a father who's in jail. His mother is not able to hold down a job. She's got an abusive partner who's also abusive towards Kwan. Um, Amal is suspended for three days in the fifth grade for the first fight he's ever been in. And that puts him on a very specific track and that is not advanced placement. So decisions are being made about these children very young. And Kwan is a, is a young boy who's very good at math. He's in like the power math nerd class. And yet someone has decided that he's not actually worth investing in. And then his favorite teacher leaves for pregnancy leave and some other things happen. We're not talking about the structural issues. We're just pointing at kids and saying, you, you. So where do we, where do we start? How do we turn this injustice system into a space that helps children and teenagers and, and doesn't persecute them? Because that's what we're doing right now. We're persecuting kids because we're making decisions as a society that don't actually reflect who these people are. Well, part of that, I think, that's, that's the idea of the founding fathers, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if you think about the, the, the documents that started um, this country, you know, the Constitution of the United States, we're talking about a document that um, didn't look at black and brown bodies as full human beings. And all of the structures that were put in place, all of the institutions that became structures that allow for these types of ideas to continue on into in perpetuity, um, this is still where we are. And so it's, it's really beginning from the idea that the system is actually alive and sick. The system is not broken. This system is, is working exactly as it was designed. And we were never to figure out that this is what was happening to us. And I think one of the beautiful things that's going on is that, you know, even myself, I was at one point probably more recently known as a pri prison uh, reformist, prison activist, prison reform activist. Um, and then George Floyd happened. And then Breonna Taylor happened. And they became a, 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 one of the many hashtags that had already become um, things that we were crying out in the streets for. And then young people began to come out into the streets. And Dave Chappelle said something very interesting. And what he said was, you know, people always say, where are the celebrities? And he said, we are not needed right now. The young people are speaking. And we have to uphold them and uplift them and support them. And see, what we're talking about in terms of young people is these are individuals that have begun to break generational curses. These are individuals who are, as Ava DuVernay had famously worn the shirt that said, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. This is the heartbeat of our ancestors' wildest dreams, the future erupting in the streets telling us that we no longer conform to the idea of reform, this thing needs to be torn down. And so I think at the beginning, we have to come, come at this from the, pr the premise of what was cannot no longer be, because what was did not, does not support the kaleidoscope of the human family as we are now living in the um, idea of Dr. King's dream. You know, and I think that that's the part that's important. You know, I was looking at some of these ideas about uh, fear and and how does how do how do things become real? And I was listening to a conversation recently about Hitler, and how Hitler was saying that he knew that what he was saying was not true, but if you repeat a lie long enough, it becomes the truth. It, it is about what what you feed the mind, and you will then fight yourself once that truth is in opposition to what you thought was, you know? And I think the other part about fear, which is really interesting, is that they make people fear the unknown. And beginning, beginning like the door to unlocking and, and ripping fear apart is understanding that fear is an acronym that stands for false evidence appearing real. 
right? And so now I can see you because before I only saw my fear, right? I saw what I, I saw the picture of what I made up about you in my mind because I don't know you, you know. Can I just say that's that kind of speaks to what I loved about punching the air and Dear Justice is they were so kind of deeply interior. You you got so deep into the minds and hearts of these young people that there were moments in punching the air where I, you know, you, you know, because it's got this connection to reality where I was just sort of jolted to think about how I had seen this story told from the outside and then to, to something about fiction, to, to just feel it from the inside and to feel the child inside this young person who was being treated as a man and that that was a very profound experience to me, and I, I, it made me as a journalist just realize what fiction can do, that maybe journalism can't do, which is just take you so deeply into somebody's subjectivity, that it becomes difficult to objectify them, and that's I think an essential ingredient of of fear. Yeah, and honestly, what you just said. Um... I think that another part of the problem, especially here in America, is we have this like hyper insistence on being right about things, right? Like we wanna be certain. And there is almost, no, not almost. There is a, I feel like we all kind of flinch a little bit at the idea of vulnerability, but you can't actually empathize with another person and you can't show compassion without being willing to be vulnerable and being willing to be wrong about what you already believe. Um, and I think that it's wildly important as we think about the lives of these kids and how these kids are affected by things like legislation and policy and just racist ideas in general, it is vital that we actually consider what it must be like to be in their position. And that involves taking our walls down and, and being willing to listen, being willing to pay attention and being willing to be wrong. You know, compassion and empathy are decisions that have to be made. Mm -hmm. and when we're moving super fast through this world, everybody is trying to like go along to get along, et cetera. It's a thing you have to kind of pause and take the time for, take the time to consider that maybe this person that you're interacting with that doesn't seem to have a great attitude, like pause and maybe consider that you don't know what's going on at their house. You know, like there's so many, so many ways that we dehumanize each other just by refusing to listen and refusing to like take a moment to be vulnerable and to, to and to empathize, if that makes sense. Um, in psychology, there's a concept called the, the fundamental attribution error, where basically bad things get attributed to a person's character, but good things get attributed to circumstance when usually it's the other way around, right? Like the bad things going on, the person who cuts you off in traffic, there's a good chance that they just need to get somewhere quickly, not that they're a, not that they're an asshole, right? Meanwhile, the person who let you in, you assume that they're just having a good day and not that they're a good person. And we really need to do a better job of switching those and thinking more about circumstance when it comes to negative, perceived negative behavior and character when we see the positive things. You know, and those wrongs um, can be wrong in big and small ways. Um, the big way in that, what if we're wrong in the way that we educate back black children? What if we are wrong in the way that we, in the way that we think they absorb information? What if we are wrong in the way that, in what we teach them about themselves? Um, as a parent, I know for a fact that my children, if I only let the school system teach them about anything, they would have never learned about who they are um, historically and culturally. So that is another layer of wrong. It's not just that, you know, when my daughter is not smiling, the teacher thinks that she has an attitude. The other layer of wrong is she is not seeing herself reflected anywhere in this classroom. Mm -hmm. um, she is not seeing herself reflected anywhere in the world. And intrinsically, intuitively, she knows that. She can't articulate that just yet. But that attitude is a representation of that 
disillusionment, this disappointment, this anger about the world. So Amal is angry at the world and he's slowly articulating that through poetry. Um, and the teacher can't see that she's wrong yet because mm -hmm. he's a great artist. You've gotten into an AP class, right? Mm -hmm. Or Quan is a great you know, mathematician. Of course, I'm doing something right because you're good at something. You've been educated to be good at this. But what if that genius was intrinsic all along? And maybe with our wow. education system, with our media, with our books that sometimes are meant for them but can be further harmful, we are pulling them away from who they truly are. Mm -hmm. So that's just another layer of wrong. Um, and young people are slowly starting to point that out. I see in the comments that um, we've been saying that young people will lead the way and they may not. Mm -hmm. They are leading the way because what Youssef was saying was that he used to call himself a prison reform activist. But I don't want to put words into your mouth, Youssef, but um, we both said the word abolition at some point during our talks. Yes. Never in a million years would I've imagined young people talking about prison abolition to the point that it's mainstream conversation. We were talking about that 20 years ago, right? And now young people say, just tear it all down. Mm -hmm. They may not know what that means and what that entails, but they're starting to speak it into reality. And somewhere along the line, people are going to pick up the pieces. Uh, journalists, uh, researchers, attorneys, policymakers are gonna start to try to figure it out simply because young people are speaking it into existence. And that's the intrinsic genius that young people have. Mm -hmm. um, and that where we can be wrong and not acknowledging that genius. Young people also have a language that previous generations didn't have. I mean, now we're talking about, you know, mental health in a way that we, especially in communities of color, we are getting a little better about being able to talk about the underlying anxiety disorders. There, I, I forget where I read this, but, um, you know, PTSD actually isn't the most accurate phrase to describe what's happening to kids in communities of color, that we should just say they are currently undergoing, uh, especially black children, they're undergoing trauma. This is not a post-traumatic situation. This is currently happening. It's happening every day. It's happening in schools. Microaggressions add up. School Things that happen in schools add up. I mean, there are a lot of great moments in both Punching the Air and um, Dear Justice where actually um, poets have come into the detention centers to teach Quan and, and Justice, uh, I mean, excuse me, um, Quan and um, Amal, and they're responding in a way because they're hearing about literature that they can connect with. I mean, at one point Amal says to his art teacher, you know, is it only old white guys from Europe who paint? Like, isn't there anyone else? And I know all of us at some point have felt that way about literature. I remember being a kid in the library going, seriously, this is it? I mean, hot, well, seriously, this is like, there's gotta be more. And I grew up in a very white suburb in Massachusetts. So really there needed to be more. And I'm not alone in that. And I think it's a really powerful moment. So can we talk about Nick and Evie, the work that you've done with these kids? And it's not just research. I mean, you're really, in these communities trying to help these kids. Can we talk about what that's like and how that informs your writing? And certainly Yousef, you've lived this. So if we could talk about that as well. Absolutely. I'll, I'll start by saying, um, you know, recently I um, I was reading something um, about our, our art industry, our art world, uh, Nick, mm -hmm. um, the publishing industry um, where someone who was well-meaning said something about, well, there's conversations around um, uh, social justice book fatigue or being tired of black pain, um, which is valid. There are a lot of, you know, of course, Nick and I have <laughs> published our fair share of social justice books and there have been others. Um, this is America is another book about prison and uh, juvenile justice that's been published. So. I think the zeitgeist is that, okay, enough already. Can we get some joy in magic? And I can honestly say there is an air of just elitism in that, in that we can look down from an ivory tower and say, enough is enough, we need some joy books. At the same time, while I was reading something about that, 
I was talking to my husband um, who teaches high school in New York City where crime has gone up tremendously and we're not seeing that on the news. Um, him talking about the young people who are still getting shot, even more so now, we're not addressing the fact that yes, there is absolutely more violence during the pandemic, during while schools are um, virtual learning, how young people are not, don't want to learn through a screen, you know, how they are just disillusioned and some have given up and gotten further into criminality. Mm -hmm. These things are still happening. And to say that we don't want those stories anymore. We want these kinds of stories. And what if a young person gets the wherewithal, a young person like Quan or you know, Amal comes out and say, I want to tell my story of pain, you know, and the publishing industry, like, no, no more. <laughs> We're tired mm -hmm. of that now. Mm -hmm. You can't tell your true story now because we've moved on to others. So this this idea of these stories still need to be heard because children are still dealing with these things. Mm -hmm. Just because we're tired of hearing from it doesn't mean that all young people have been let out of prison. Doesn't mean that there's not somebody some young person, you know, carrying a weapon, trying to find retribution. And I'm thinking of Jason's long way down. There mm -hmm. are, you know, I don't remember his, the character's name, but there are about 50 boys right now going through the motions mm -hmm. of, you know, getting revenge. All right. But there's only mm -hmm. been one book that addresses that. So mm -hmm. I'm in the position where, yes, we need more types of stories, but at the same time, gosh, it's going to get worse. It is going to get worse because people, their unemployment, homelessness. Yep. Um, I went to New York City, you know, just over the weekend. I mean, it looks like 1974 again. I wasn't alive, but my friends told me. I was like, whoa, it looks like 1980s New York. And my older friends were like, no, it looks like 1970s New York. Um, so all that to say, um, I can I can say those things because I'm on the ground. I have to be on the ground and not part of the not be part of industry conversations because it's still part of corporate structure. It's still about what's selling, what products do we want to push, what products do we want to see versus the reality that's happening on the ground. And um, it's a uh, um, it's things are going to get worse. Things are getting worse because I hear it from other mothers and I hear it from the teachers who are my friends. And um, that is going to inform the stories that I write, who I write about it, with, regardless of what people want to buy, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> no, no. It's no, emotional. Absolutely yeah. Right. yeah, but I, I did a, I, I had the opportunity to write an op-ed this summer about how like, read all of it. Like, don't, don't just read, like, yes, fine. I'm glad, I understand when people are like, I want to see books about black joy. Me too. Mm -hmm. But also, also make sure we're reading the books that are informing the experiences and or the books that are informed by experiences. And like the thing about this part of the conversation is the people who are saying that they're getting this fatigue are not children. <laughs> These mm -hmm. are adults mm -hmm. who are speaking about children's books, right? So like there is this kind of gatekeeping mentality where Okay, well, we well we think that there are too ma too many of these, and I'm like, have you been in a classroom? Have you actually asked members of the target audience what they want to read? Have you read any of the thing that the members of the target audience are writing? Because I have, right? I interact with young writers consistently. They send me things that they are working on, and most of the time, it is pretty dire, and it can be a little scary sometimes. Like reading, like I, I remember there was one kid who sent me this piece of work that he was doing. And then I think the last line was like, and then everybody died. Like <laughs> these kids are writing very dark, sad things. And I'm not surprised, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you're in our position, me and Evie, having the ability to, yes, let me, let me take your experience, let me put it in fiction and also put a little light in it, that's a huge deal. And it's something that we can't, like she said, we can't stop doing it. I've spent a significant amount of time um, in detention centers, interacting with the kids there and they just want to be heard. Like they just want somebody to listen. Um, I was talking, I was talking to Nell and Miwa before we started about how like you go into these spaces 
And these young people, like I've had young people in detention literally spill out their entire life story to me within like a few minutes of sitting down. I am a, I, they don't know me from anybody. I am a stranger to them. But the fact that I'm willing to sit and listen, these are not scary monster people. These are human beings who are children and who really just want somebody to believe in them, you know? And I think that that is a really important thing that we have to recognize before they go into the system. Like recognize that children just need somebody to pay them some attention and to believe in them and express that belief in them before they wind up in a situation like Amal or like Kwan. Um, and, and I think that like all of us have the ability to take a little bit of time and be a little bit courageous when it comes to caring about somebody else. Hmm. You know, that, 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 that is, um, I think the importance of what's being revealed speaks to something that I've talked about, you know, on the speaking circuit, you know, um, people often tell me, they say, wow, you know, you don't seem angry, you know, oh, well, I've had a lot of time to deal with this. <laughs> you know, I listened to the words of Dr. Maya Angelou, who said, you know, you can take your anger and dance it and march it and vote it. She said, you can do everything about it. And then she said, talk it, never stop talking it. And so there's this overwhelming understanding that I have as a motivational speaker as well, and as someone who's gone through the prison industrial complex, um, in understanding that telling your story heals you and you will never be fully healed. You always have to revisit and revisit and revisit. And then the other side of that is now you're on the quote unquote or so-called privilege side. And so in your privilege, in your platform that you have now, what are you doing? And I think that the, the platform allows for us to be able to use these types of important works to really um, provide water to the seeds of greatness inside of every one of us. Because mm -hmm. the biggest thing I think that is that is being overlooked, especially when it comes to young people who are going to be the future caretakers of tomorrow, that is a fact, right? Is that we need to be pouring into them the overwhelming understanding that psychosocially they matter. Mm -hmm. Because when a child begins to believe in themselves, magic happens. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes it takes a long time because so much of the, the, the murkiness of life we have to sift through and climb through and we look back and we say, wow, where's all the time gone? I know people in prison right now who have been there since I was in prison, who was young like me when I was there, who was still there, never came home. And finally are realizing, man, if I only had somebody that could look at my psychological profile as a youngster, perhaps I may not have been able to, um, perhaps I would have been able to break this chain mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. degradation, all of this stuff, but they're in prison and they can't. And so they're still working through that part, you know, and I think that it's a beautiful thing to tell stories that show the sunshine. But the other part is to marry that thing that we are going through right now, like COVID-19 and having to social distance uh, in spite of what people in higher offices are saying, um, is that we now have to look at that. We have to, we have to like Beyonce said, world stop. Okay, carry on, right? The creative forces have said, the world needs to stop. And I need everyone to reorient themselves to what's important. And for the first time, we now can see the sky and hear the birds and all of the other stuff, even though we are on the ground and it's terrible, we are at war. And this, this is a war that can be um, fixed, just like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you've worked with parents, uh, with the children of um, parents whose parents are incarcerated currently. Um, and you had 
a really visceral response to something that happened in um, Dear Justice. Could you just talk about that for a minute? Because you're coming you know, to it as a reader, but also you have had this real, very real experience with these kids whose parents who have been you know, arrested in front of them. Yeah, I, I was late to the game, but I spent a lot of this weekend reading both books. Um, and um, I wrote my first book, All Alone in the World, in part because I was researching foster care and I met too many kids who had been placed in foster care at the moment that their parent was arrested um, or kids who'd been left alone at that moment. So when I was reading, you know, the beginning of Dear Justice, there's a scene where his father is arrested in front of him. And that just ripped me open, even though I had heard this story from dozens or probably hundreds of kids. You wrote it, Nick, in such you know what I loved about it? It was a tremendously painful scene, but there was joy in it. I think this distinction between pain fiction and joy fiction, it, that's not how life is. I, mm -hmm. The detail that really leapt out at me was that his glass of ginger ale got knocked over as, I'm not conflating two scenes, am I? That was the mm -mm. scene. No, okay. that's all one thing. Um, you know, it just, just that little detail makes you realize, and then the police are very brutal with him. Uh, and that's something that kids had told me about over and over is that their natural response to seeing somebody, to use your completely accurate word, Yusuf, to seeing their parents kidnapped by men with guns, uh, which was a word small children used with me often, you know, his reaction was terror and anger, and that was response. But just the spilled ginger ale told me that he was a child and that there was joy in his home, whether or not his father was breaking the law. Um, and it just really made me realize why, although I write nonfiction, I spend most of my reading time reading fiction. It, the, it, just, it just cracked the experience open for me to read your description of it. I don't know if that was your question. I could just quickly say, I didn't know there was a thing called social justice fatigue or black pain fatigue. I didn't know that people were running into that, but that horrifies me because I, like, I had to stop watching TV a while ago because I couldn't find a single show that didn't center on a woman being raped and dismembered as it's kind of central plot device or like the white YA stuff I read growing up. It was all like suicide and abortion and, you know, it, that's what I loved about it as, as a young teenager. So that just strikes me as a tremendous double standard. Um, mm. That is the phrase, double this standard. This particular is kind of pain phrase. has become suddenly too much. And wow, I mean, tell that to the Grimm's brothers. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have fairy tales. Those, those were horrible stories. That's anyway. I, Wait, I don't want to misspeak that. Do you agree, Nick? Um, is that, am I misspeaking here? Is that the conversation happening? Is it too much what? or is it that black pain is too much or what is it? Is it not, it's not that it's, I don't think it's that it's too much. I think it's imbalance. I don't want to misspeak and miss. No, no, no. Well, I, you what the conversation right? is happening. Yeah, no, but the, you, you, the, the word fatigue is the word that I've been hearing too. Like yeah, black pain, hearing. like black pain fatigue. Like people are fatigued by the number of books that center on black pain. And they want, we want more books about black joy, which great. That would be great too. But like exactly what Nell said, if you don't, but the other thing for me is like, if you don't want to read it, don't read it. That that's mm -hmm. a, that's, you have the option of not reading it, but that doesn't mean that publishers should stop publishing it. You right. know, I was surprised. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, um, we do have a couple of questions, but I just, I want to go back to something with Nick for two seconds. I mean, Quan is a big fan of Lemony Snicket. He's mm -hmm. reading, you know, Alice in Wonderland. He has a set of nightmares that are bait and he thinks, oh, I shouldn't have read Alice in Wonderland. I mean, we aren't, we need to publish a multitude of voices for kids. They're going to find the stories that they feel, you know, reflect their experience or that they have access to. I mean, Lemony Snicket, those are fun books. They're really fun, wild, weird books that if you're a certain age, you that's all you want. And you want more like that. And, and mm -hmm. you know, anything that gets a kid to, I'm, I'm a big believer in anything that gets a kid to read, 
is a start. But I do think there are conversations that are making people profoundly uncomfortable in ways. And I've been in the book business for a long time and this goes in waves. Like you see moments where it's like, we wanna publish all of this all of the time for this amount of time. And then it stops and then it pops back. And each time someone feels like, oh, this is new and novel. And I'm like, wait a minute, no, no, I, let me tell you about 1990 a while ago. So it, I think we need to keep having these conversations and I think we need to keep pushing on them, but I think we also need kids to reflect to us what they want to read. You know, I was one of those kids where I was, I was indiscriminate. I read all sorts of wild stuff and whatnot. I've gotten a little pickier in my old age, but I love listening to a kid tell me about a book they just read that they love more than life itself. And they're talking about characters like they're, they're like they're living, breathing people. Um, I like having a response to a story. I will never get tired of stories. I mean, you can't be a bookseller and not love story, right? You can't be a writer and not love story. But we have a responsibility, you know, you as writers, me as the bookseller, you know, publishing people. We all have a collective responsibility to find a way to reflect our society. And sometimes we do it well, and sometimes, man, we miss the mark, and sometimes we make up for it, and sometimes we just do cool, cool things. And other times we look at each other and go, oh, man, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> um, oh, man. So the thing that I'm deeply grateful for is that we have these conversations. I would just like to not see one get precedence over the other simply because someone else is uncomfortable. I think it ultimately is about the readers and what readers want to experience. And now we have a third question. So can I interrupt my, I will get off my soapbox for a second. Sorry, I'm a very passionate bookseller. Can we run through some of these questions for a second? Um, we have one, how do you educate your own children during these times on the topic of policing? And then there's a sort of follow-up disrespectful acts question mark. Wow. Whew. So. <laughs> I mean, I have 10 children, so I get the opportunity to educate and re-educate and re-educate. And, and one of the most interesting things I think that the younger children are experiencing is the total shift of lifestyle that the older ones had never gotten an opportunity mm -hmm. to experience. Um, they come from a world where I call the, uh, the penthouse apartment that I lived in on the 30, on 138th Street um, because we just had no elevator and we lived on the top floor. It was six floors, six flights walking up. Um, and that's, that's where we live. But part of the, the conversation is a conversation that is, I, I'm trying to do what my, my parents did. My parents, my mother in particular, she used to always tell me that she was raised in the Jim Crow South. And I never really truly understood what she meant by that until I got until like the system ran over us and felt good about it. And they, they were okay with it. You know, it was just like, Hey, it's Monday, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that part of the, the challenging questions um, or responses to questions now is why is this? And why is that? Why, why is it that we are living in a world where Breonna Taylor could be murdered and the charges are for shooting at a wall that has nothing to do with the situation. You know, my, my third youngest child, Amira, as we were explaining to her what happened, she was crying. And it was, it was such a, a really interesting um, thing that was happening because Right after that, she was back being a youth. She was like, you know, she was a child, you know, and she was eating dinner and everything was cool. But the total immersion of feeling she felt, she said, I don't want to live in America anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live here, you know? And it's that kind of conversation of trying to figure out how do we give them enough hope in the future that they have to be the change agents that we all seek, right? Because it's one thing to look at the system and say, can you fix this? Can you help us? We're, we're, we're dying here. But another thing to say, as, as, my, as our professor, uh, Evie, said once in the classroom that we were in, she said, you know, she said, if we decided tomorrow that 
the system of oppression that we are experiencing ceases to exist, tomorrow it will cease to exist. But it's about us being unified, us being, uh, us, us understanding, right? Us having a plan that doesn't just say, you know, man, this weekend, whoo, I'm gonna have a nice time. It's gonna be sunglasses in Advil, you know? We need to not only have a weekend plan, but we gotta have a five year, 10 year, we gotta have an intergenerational plan so that our young people understand that this is the, the marathon of life that they're in is that as they go older, they package themselves into the, I forget what they call that thing that they, the, they, the baton, they package themselves into the baton to pass to their younger generation so that we no longer have a disconnect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But that we are utilizing everything that we understand in the collective understandings to really move the needle. And that conversation is a, is, is a little bit, it's weird because it's challenging for me to have only because my children see me, you know, that, you know, my youngest son, he's like, dad, you were once my age. <laughs> and, you know, he sees, when he sees punching the air, he's like, when he first saw punching the air, he was like, that's me because he this is how he looks he's four years old but he wears his hair like this and everything <laughs> you know and it was just such a beautiful thing but you know that part that part of being able to really infuse enough of the hope of tomorrow into their body heart and mind that they can they can handle any why as Nietzsche says, if you know the why, you can you can handle. I mean, if you know, the, yeah, I think it's the, if you know the why, you can live anyhow. And so they can handle the why because they know what's at stake. They know what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, just let's see. So someone else follows up with that was my question. How do we combat this false sense of optimism in school board and administrations who push back on important books? As a high school teacher, I'm deeply concerned by an unwillingness to adopt important fiction titles for fear of narratives of quote, the downtrodden black person, exact words my superior use. How do we persuade, uh, persuade administration and parents that these books deserve a place? And that's from Sahar Mustafa. I, I kind of want to go back on what I I'm initially bringing it up. I think um, someone said, um, I think the fatigue stems from the imbalance. Sarah says that um, mm -hmm. as a daughter of Congolese immigrants, I do believe there is an imbalance um, because I was trying to get published about 15 years ago and I could not get the type of stories that I wanted to tell published because they were sci-fi fantasy. I'm not the kind of sci-fi. SFNF that's published now, but just more reality-based sci-fi fantasy. And now I, I believe I could tell those kinds of stories, but there is an imbalance. And what I'm talking about is we need to address what's really happening with the children in urban places in all parts of the country and the world and acknowledge that they already have joy. Um, and when we're writing about children dealing with traumatic issues, they're not dealing with trauma on a minute by minute basis in the way that we tell our stories. There are moments of joy. They're not waking up every morning and like the suffering, right? They got to eat, you know, they watch the TV, they're laughing, they're cracking jokes. And this, there is a overall arching oppression. And even if we have the black child going you know, going on an adventure and slaying monsters or what have mm -hmm. you, I think it would be dishonest to not address the larger issues, just a yes. moment of it, right? Yes. Yep, yes, um, <laughs> Okay, so yes, so in that sense, um, show, you know, share those stories about social justice and the, and I don't wanna say, don't think of it as downtrodden black people tell the stories of black children and black people as well as here are moments of joy in the book mm -hmm. and here are some you know black children going on adventure um i do believe that you do need to tell them stories to fit it into a curriculum to say something about our society um mm -hmm. how are you going to understand juvenile justice without all our books 
And the key is to read all our books and be honest in how you're reading it and to say, okay, to critique them. It's okay to compare and contrast. You don't have to compare us as authors. You compare the choices that the characters are making and the backgrounds that they're coming from. You could look at it from a literary standpoint. Please look at it from a literary standpoint mm -hmm. because we are writers and we make word choices and we craft our sentences and we don't wanna be just relegated to social justice book. We wanna be artists as well. Um, so read it in that way. You could read all these books in many different ways. You know, Yusef and I are talking about art and classical art. Mm -hmm. We make certain choices about how the words land on the page. And I'm sure Nick did the same with Dear Justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways that you could enter our books that it doesn't have to be about the downtrodden black. Mm -hmm. It could be, here is art on the page. What are the choices the authors make? What is it saying about the child? And what is it saying about society? Mm -hmm. Also, I, just real quick, that sounds like such a cop out to me. Like, I so as a, I will say this as a person who has had a book banned. I had a book ban. I, Dear Martin has been banned, and the person who banned it hadn't read it. Uh, this is a superintendent of a of a school. It's former superintendent. She retired, thank God. Um, but she had hadn't read the book. She had no idea what was in the book. It's just it's such a cop out to me when somebody's like, "Well, we don't really want to." Do we really want to do these books about these downtrodden? I'm like, if you had read the book, you wouldn't have used that word, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I think it's important to challenge, challenge yes. the people in positions of authority to actually read the books. If we, if you can mm -hmm. have kids still reading The Great Gatsby, if they're still reading Lord of the Flies, they, like all of these books are tragic. Like anything that we read by Shakespeare, besides, I don't, we didn't read very many Shakespearean comedies when I was in school, it was all mm -hmm, the tragedies, mm -hmm. right? So like, mm -hmm. if we could read tragedies about white people, they can also read and process tragedies about black people. And I think that that's a really important thing to push back on. So like, downtrodden is the wrong word. And it's a word that lets me know that you haven't read any of these books. A separate piece, <laughs> Catcher in the Rye. I Come mean, on. Like, Bible. These are not light, yeah, these are not light, fluffy stories. So I think, again, this comes back to our original point, the way the way consequences are meted out differently for white kids and black kids and brown kids, and the way the language that we ascribe to these kids and the moralities that we, we just need to stop reaching for the codification and reach more for the person. I mean, one of the things that's so beautiful about Nick and E.B. and Yousef's books are the fact that these kids are so alive and so vibrant and so real and smart assy and they're just great. And you end up rooting for these kids. You end up really rooting hard for these kids. And that's, I mean, that's why I turn to fiction. I happen to like to talk about fictional characters as, as if they're real. It's why I'm a bookseller um, or one of the reasons I'm a bookseller. But we have one more question and then I'm afraid I'm probably just gonna have to let us all go off and do our other <laughs> oh. which is terrible because I'd rather keep hanging out with everyone. Sorry, no, what do you have? Oh, I said that one quote we had talked about. Yeah. I'd love to share it if it's yes, We will, we will, I promise. Um, before, I promise we will get that in. But do you have any thoughts on things we can change as a society to teach children more about these topics? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So many things. <laughs> it, it, yeah, you know, I, I, think, I, I, I think I think just just right off the top, teach them the truth. Yeah. You know, because part of the truth is when we when we become adults, we're like, like, how did they teach us about bunny rabbits and Santa Claus and all of this other stuff? Like, you know, like I'm buying my children these gifts. <laughs> I'm Santa Claus. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> but then, but then the other part too, I think, is you know, just historically, right? You know, I, I keep coming back to this quote by Angela Davis: "We as a people have historical amnesia." Mm -hmm. um, and I think she was really talking about the way that we've been socialized. You know, we've been socialized not to know. We've been socialized to put a pretty spin on it. You know. Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King wasn't assassinated. He he died at you know mm -hmm. such and such an age. You know, no, we need to talk about the truth because at the same time, it heals us. And I'm talking about the total, the us, the United States, right? It heals us and it and it and it does something different because I've met too many people who just happen to be children of former slave owners. Um who've said, you know, I want to use all of my privilege to figure out 
how to fix this, how to change this, you know, um, that's just, that's my piece. There's an Elie Wiesel quote. Um, he, when Elie Wiesel won the Nobel Prize in 1986, um, there's a quote during his Nobel Prize speech. He said, it's the memory of evil that will serve as a shield against evil. And it is the thing that I will take with me forever because you are absolutely right, Yusuf. It is about making sure people know what the truth is. We are so, so I have this new practice of sitting while I am writing books now, I sit with nature documentaries on in the background. I don't know why, it's just this thing lately that I like, it's helping me to kind of tune in, I guess. Um, but the animal kingdom is truly savage. Like the way that animals, and they are all about survival. And like, yes, we are a part of the animal kingdom, but we are like cognitively advanced. But there are a, like, there is being compassionate, being kind, being empathetic. And then there is just being like asinine and refusing to look truth in the face. And those are the things that I just can't abide. Like pretending that the truth isn't the truth because the truth makes you too uncomfortable. I'll never be able to get with that. So I think that it's important, just like you said, to tell people the truth, especially kids. Yes, there's a way that you can tell tell the truth to kids in a way that doesn't like traumatize them, but they, they do need to know what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have to add one thing um, that we learned in college, Yusef, from our professor. And that was one of the first things you said to me when we reunited. Um, uh, it let me know what kind of character you were. Um, so we learned, um, we were learning about African centered concepts in college. Um, and that is the foundation for who I am in the same way that we're speaking in English here and we're, you know, we're bringing up psychology or what have you. Um, African, con there are African words. One word describes such a big idea. And if, you know, you speak another language, you know that there are languages around the world that convey such huge weighty, profound ideas with just one word. And that's, you know, and that's one of those words is, um, is it, is it Zulu? It is Zulu, right? Um, no, do, do, Dogon process of initiation, Dogon of Mali. Yeah, let's say it together. So the Dogon have four systems of initiation and the initiation doesn't mean you're being trained to be something. It means four processes to understanding truth and they come from the perspective that truth is a process. Even if we tell a child the truth, it's going to take them some while to understand what that truth is, right? Yeah. So it's Jiri So, truth at face value. Jiri So, yeah. Bene So, truth from the side, Bolo So, truth from behind. And so what's the last one? G so Jiri So, So Dai, um, yeah. the astonishing word. word. No, Jiriso is the last one. Bene so, bolo so, Jiriso. Jiriso, bene so, bolo so, so dai. Yes, we're speaking another language. The idea <laughs> is that, you know, truth is like a fruit where you peel away the layers and get to the core of something, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to experience that truth in the same way. And what it's really saying is that truth is an experience and it's a personal process. So we are all speaking some side of some sort of truth here, but we are coming from it from different angles. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things I learned as a published author and having mm -hmm. conversations with mm -hmm. colleagues. We might saying one thing, but we're all like, we have different experiences with that one idea. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things is that we give a lot of power to teachers in that mm -hmm. we expect them to know all these things. Therefore, they can impart truth to young people when maybe they not have not maybe they have not gone through a certain process themselves. And I'm thinking of a particular book stamped by Jason Reynolds. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it's a deeply profound book stamped from the beginning is deeply profound. And there are teachers hailing it, but I'm wondering, are you really getting that information? You know, are you really understand, understanding the history of how black people got to be seen as monsters you know, how animal features are attributed to black. Do you understand the history of that? So that when you look at your black children in the classroom, where those ideas come from and how they've been planted in your subconscious. So in that sense, it's a process of excavating 
the truth and working on it and working on it and working on it for years. So that that same truth has different meaning every time you convey it to a child and every time you tell it to yourself. So it's it's a constant work. We don't know everything. I want to say I don't know everything as an author just because I'm writing for children and people come to hear me speak. You know, I'm not on Twitter anymore because it was a lot of pressure. <laughs> it was just like, you know, whatever, some 20,000 people listening to me, I don't know anything. You mm -hmm. know, don't come follow me for anything because I'm figuring it out. Right. So in that sense, I don't like the idea of it that we expect someone to know everything and we impart a certain truth onto people. You're still working on it. No matter how many books you've mm -hmm. written, you're still figuring it out just like everybody else. I don't know what the question was. <laughs> That was awesome. You know what? That is the answer to the questions that all of us have. But I know Nell, Nell did have a, a story she wanted to share, and I think this is a good point to do it, um, because as much as I really would like to keep going, I think the Center for Fiction may need their internet back or something like that. Oh, I'll be really, really, really brief. Um, I just wanted to, to bring the voice of a friend who can't be here because uh, she's incarcerated at age 40 as she was at age 14 when I first met her. Um, and and um, through all those years, I've been bringing her books or sending her books. And this is something that she said a long time ago, many, many years ago when she was out and more optimistic about her future. Um, but she had spent six months in her first stint in juvenile hall was for running uh, from a group home because they wouldn't let her have a job because it interfered with their non-existent program. So she left and she ended up in juvenile hall for six months at 14. And I, I asked her, how did you, you know, how'd you make it? And she said that she spent most of her time sitting in her cell and reading. And it, I'm, I wanna share this because I wish and I hope that your books will get into those institutions because they would, she said, I lived in my books until I could get away. I read about heroines who were kept in towers. I read about women who survived obstacles and reading about survivors made me feel like one. If they could leave slavery and defy Rome, so could I. And I, I ever since then, I've just seen books as, you know, I guess it's as kind of magic portals. I mean, these were dark books she was reading. These were books of pain and not always triumph, but they, they got her through and in some ways they got her out. So I'm really hoping that your books, which I just loved, will make their way in because I, I think they could change lives. Can I can I just say this this one Absolutely. piece too to what you just said? You know, one of the, the beautiful things about books um, and imagination is that what I found going through prison was that anywhere my mind went, my body followed. Mm -hmm. And so even though I was physically in bondage, even, you know, as I was reading what I was reading and meditating and drawing, I was free all of those years because my mind was free. And so to your point, it's important that works like this get into those places, especially the most downtrodden, most awful places in, in the world, because it allows people to free themselves from whatever prison they may be in physically or mentally, you know? That comes through in punching the air. Mm -hmm. memory mm -hmm. yeah. and that Absolutely. seems like a really good moment to say thank you nick thank you <laughs> Nell. thank you ibi thank you yusuf and i do want to leave the audience with one thing before we hand things back to um, the center for fiction and it's a line from the writer attica Locke, who was also one of the screenwriters on ava duvernay's um a couple of different projects for her, but the one I'm referencing actually, oddly enough, well, I shouldn't say oddly enough, it's it's not related to tonight specifically, um, Little Fires Everywhere, but the line is um, something I carry around with me personally, which is, did you make good choices or did you have good choices? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really something we should be asking ourselves, especially as adults. It's very easy for us to say, well, I would have done it differently. And the question is, well, really, would you have? <laughs> would you have? <laughs> So on that note, thank you to the Center for Fiction. Thank you again, Nell, Nick, Evie, and Yusef. It has been a great, huge pleasure. And good night, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks, good night. Thank thanks, thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great conversation. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Read these books.
Yes, read, the read all of the books multiple times. <laughs> you should reread all of them too. Good night. Thanks.